Now, we're continuing our uh, journey through the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Uh, tonight, we'll be responsively reading questions and answers 89 and 90. I'll begin. How is the word made effectual to salvation? The Spirit of God makes the reading, especially the preaching of the word, an effectual means of convincing and converting sinners and building them up in holiness, comfort, through faith unto salvation. How is the word to be read and heard that it may become effectual to salvation? The word may become effectual to salvation. We must attend thereunto with diligence, preparation, and prayer. And receive it with faith and love. And lay it up in our hearts and practice it in our lives. And for the scripture reading, uh, we be reading 1 Corinthians 1, verse 21. <clears throat> this is God's holy word. For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would <clears throat> work in us, that we would understand uh, sometimes these very uh, difficult uh, teachings in your word. Uh, may it take hold of our hearts. May it be fruitful in our lives. May it conform us more and more to that image of Christ, we pray. Amen. Uh, I once saw a man drop dead on the ground while walking with his wife. And at first there was confusion. Why did he fall? Did he pass out? Is the area around us safe? Uh, my sister, who was a nurse, she moved in to check on the man, and then immediately she directed someone nearby to call the paramedics. She began administering CPR until the ambulance arrived, which eventually led to the man actually being resuscitated uh, taken to the hospital. But no one in that moment thought about trying to, res to revive this dead man with their words. Right? They didn't try to speak him back to life. Words would have been insufficient for that occasion of death. On another occasion of death, probably had to be a year later, I remember the date, April 23rd, 2008. I was living in Bel Air, Maryland as a caretaker for my grandparents. Uh, Kelsey was living at Elizabethtown College in Pennsylvania, and she had scheduled us to meet with our wedding photographer. And I told my grandfather and my grandmother that I love them and that if they needed anything, don't hesitate to call, and I'll be right back. I drove to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I parked on Main Street. I exited my car. I paid the meter when my cell phone rang. Standing there on Main Street, I had learned that my grandfather had died in that same room I had left him in with his wife by his side. And he knew, he knew it was his final moments, and he told his wife so. And in their final minutes together, they prayed together and they spoke of their hope in the gospel. Words were sufficient for this occasion of death. Words spent in communion with their Lord and Savior. Each of us has limited time. Breaths and heartbeats are numbered. But the deeper death, the spiritual death, the death that we can be delivered from. You know, Augustine and Martin Luther, they wrote about sin being homo and curvitas in se. In Latin, I hope I pronounced that right, Sheila, uh, 
In Latin, this means that sin is man curved in upon himself. That we love ourselves so much that we are incapable of fully loving God as we are intended, or even to love our neighbors as God intended. That we constantly preoccupy the center of our own hearts, the place that God owns, the place where God should belong. And that even though we were created to love God and love our neighbors as ourselves, instead we curve in on ourselves. Because we have rebelled against our creator, from our created purpose, there is an eternal death, a judgment that is coming from God against all our sin, all our unrighteousness, all of our selfishness. And in this sense, many people are the walking dead. And the world is full of the walking dead. Are words sufficient for this, the most serious occasion of death? Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, the hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. These dead will hear his word and be brought to life. Uh, today, as we uh, discuss some of the doctrines contained in Scripture that the Shorter Catechism uh, conden uh, condenses for us, uh, I want to talk about the power of the Word, the content of the Word, and the use of the Word. First, the power of the Word. If we are dead in our sins, and then the answer is, or the question rather, is how are we brought to life? Regeneration regeneration. However, the dead cannot bring themselves back to life. We need supernatural intervention. Uh, we've been talking about these ordinary means of grace, the channels by which we are fed grace. God is pleased to use ordinary means to extraordinary ends. He uses what seems to be natural means for supernatural purposes. And one of these means of grace is Scripture, God's Word. We are given the Word of God to hear and to read, which is the power of God unto salvation, Romans 1.16. I mentioned last week that God inspired or breathed out the Bible. They're his words written by man, as the Holy Spirit used these men, writing in their own personalities and styles, but he inspired them to produce words that belong to him. Hebrews 4.12, which I referenced last week, says that the word of God, it's living, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword piercing to the division of soul and of spirit joints and of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Living means we aren't just reading his words, but when we read God's word, we are encountering God himself. We are fellowshipping with the Lord when we read his words. These words are personal. God is life and his words are life-giving. When you encounter God's word, you are fellowshipping with the living God who raises dead people to life. The psalmist knows this. The psalmist pleads, give me life according to your word, Psalm 119. And it's active as God's word possesses power. God's word is not static. God's word is living and active. His word, the Lord says, that goes out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish what I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God's word always, not sometimes, not most of the time, God's word always accomplishes its purpose. The content of the word. The content of the word. Um, what is the content? 
Puritan Thomas Watson said that, quote, Scripture is a spiritual glass to dress our souls by. It shows us more than we can see by the light of a natural conscience that may discover gross sins, but the glass of the word shows us heart sins, vain thoughts, unbelief. Watson says, and it not only shows us our spots, but washes them away. You see what he's saying, right? Scripture points out our death condition to us. But more than that, it's the means by which the Holy Spirit uses to actually give us life. It diagnoses the problem, at the same time gives us the prescription. Uh, I told you the story, I don't know, some time ago, a few months ago, about uh, my neighbor who had pretty sure it was a drug dealer uh, back in Pennsylvania. Uh, he was having his second child with his new live-in girlfriend. And uh, he was determined that with this child, he was going to be a better father and a better husband, I guess, a boyfriend uh, to this girlfriend. I guess for his previous girlfriend and previous child, he had failed. But this time, right, it was going to be different, according to him. And during this time, we'd been developing a friendship, and I was sharing the gospel with him, and I was explaining the Christian doctrine of sin. Now, he was some years older than me, claimed he had never been to a church. Uh, so every time I would try to explain the doctrine of sin to explain the gospel, he would get hung up on sin, like he wasn't understanding what it meant. And uh, if you remember, I, I, I told you this a couple months ago, he was standing outside when I was coming home uh, late one evening from the church, and he was standing in the middle of the street, smoking marijuana, which indicated to me two things. One, he was stressed. But two, he was standing in the street. He was waiting for me to come home to talk to me. So I got out of my car. I approached him, and I asked him how he was. And he poured out his heart. And he said to me that he had tried to be a better man. He mustered up all of his strength, but he couldn't do it. And he was letting down his daughter and his girlfriend, just like he did before. And after we talked for a little bit, I told him, I said, you know, the Bible has a name for this. It's called sin. You can't muster up enough strength to defeat sin. Only Christ has. Homo and curvitas in se. God's word has spoken this to us. God's spirit has quickened our hearts and given us ears to, to hear these difficult teachings of scripture that, that we would have them internalized in our own hearts, that we would trust Christ by faith and we would repent from our sins and, and turn from them to Christ and depend on him for the strength, that we would not rely on our own strength, and the entire story of Scripture is about God dealing with this until he sent his own son to put to death our selfishness, our rebellion, and our death. To put it all to death. And to free those enslaved to their passions, to grant liberty from the yoke of our sin and our law-breaking. The Bible diagnoses the true problem for the failing father. And the Bible, through the power of God's Spirit, makes him alive to the living hope. There is only one hope. Louis Burkhoff, he wrote, quote, We distinguish two parts in the Word of God as a means of grace, namely the law and the gospel. Scripture contains law and gospel. Law is an expression of God's character and his will for us. The law tells us, do this. And these are good things that we should do. It's what God wants done. It reflects who he is in any particular circumstance. But the problem that we quickly see that my neighbor saw is that we are dead in our sins. We're unable to do this perfectly. The gospel tells us not do this, 
but that Jesus had done it for you on your behalf. On April 26, very close to your birthday, Eden, April 23rd, April 26, 1518, Martin Luther participated in defending his views during uh, the beginning of the Reformation and and his theses, and this is now referred to as the Heidelberg uh, Disputation. And uh, there was another great person there, Martin Bucer, who would go on a few years later to become the great reformer of Strasbourg. He heard Luther here and just loved what he had heard. But Luther commented... The law says do this, and it's never done. Grace says believe in this, and everything is already done. Jesus said it is finished. And do you realize how reassuring this is? My neighbor, as far as I know, he never did receive it. But how reassuring of a message that is for those of us that realize we can't do this as God intended. We are dead in our sins. God's law is beautiful. It's a revelation of who God is. We shouldn't despise the law. But in revealing his holiness and character and what we should be like, we see our homo incurvitas in say. We have fallen short of God's glory. We are impotent. We are dead. We are unable to live as we should. The law alone will destroy you, short of the gospel. But suddenly, with the gospel, our worth and our future, are they depend not on what we can do, but what on Jesus has already done for us. I am loved by God, not because of my own hand or strength, as pathetic as that is but by the hand of his only son. Then, if there's nothing I can do to earn my salvation, there's nothing that I can do to lose it. Because the gospel says it is finished. Three, the use of the word. The catechism emphasizes the importance of reading the word. Uh, especially the the, the preaching of the word as an effective means of of converting sinners. We have a great tradition in the Reformed and Presbyterian tradition of restoring that focus back on the reading and preaching of the word. Um, The church where I ministered previously was the United Church of Christ, and if you know anything about that, uh, it was the first in a lot of things that you, you don't want your church to be the first in. I've heard that about Mississippi. I think some of you told me that. You said, we're on the first of a lot of lists we wish we weren't, right? Well, the UCC was the first in a lot of things that you don't want your church to be the first in. And um, we led them out of the United Church of Christ into the PCA. And um, in the United Church of Christ, what they did was they put the pulpit on one side of the room, and they put the communion table in the middle, and then they had a lectern over here. And that communicated something, something that should not be communicated in in churches. But as they were redoing their sanctuary, what happened was, in God's providence, Presbyterian coincidence, right? What happened was the elders of the church at the time when the sanctuary was being rebuilt or remodeled, they, they didn't know what these signals meant, moving the pulpit. And they looked at it, and they just said, something doesn't feel right about this. And they paid the construction company to tear it down and move the pulpit back in the center of the room. Uh, decades later, when we came along and, and led them out of the UCC, R. Kent Hughes, who wrote Disciplines of a Godly Man, came to preach at our church, and I went out for lunch with him afterwards. And he said, praise God, that pulpit was in the center of the room. He said, that tells everyone who comes into this church the word, the importance of the word in worship. He said, many sinners are going to come to know Jesus here. And by God's grace, they did. 
The catechism, of course, emphasizes the, the word of God, especially the preaching. Uh, John Stott, who's an Anglican priest, he passed away, I don't know, 12 years ago. He said, preaching is indispensable to Christianity, for Christianity is, in its very essence, a religion of the word of God. We are people of the word. Preaching is held in such high regard in our tradition, and I don't think I have to belabor that point tonight, but in our modern culture today, a personal Bible reading is a luxury that we have that many people in history did not have. Praise God for that. Uh, printing press, right? But now uh, with Bible apps, I don't know where my phone is, right? But we all have access to God's Word immediately. Uh, we got Bibles for the youth, for the Bible study. And, uh, you know, when we opened up to look at Colossian last Wednesday... I thought, you know, I was going to have all these teens pulling out their phone, which, you know, I guess I would have been okay with, but they didn't. Every single one of them went over to the table and they picked up a hard copy of the Word of God and they opened it up and we read it together. Praise God. But if God's Word is the source of life, if it's the daily grace to nourish us, and it's the means by which we commune with Him, then it's necessary for us to have a steady diet of God's Word in some form. Reading, um, listening to it in your car, but most of all, preaching. Preaching. But it's also important for you to minister to others who are dead in their sins with the life-giving power of God's penetrating Word and life-giving Word. This is where we distinguish between God's internal call and God's external call. The external call is made when you share the gospel or you hear the, the preaching of the word. We should give the external call out to everyone without discrimination. But the internal call is that act when God's Holy Spirit uses his holy word to bring about life to a dead sinner. He regenerates dead sinners. And not everyone who hears the external call receives the internal call. But as we said earlier, God's word always accomplishes his purpose. I taught an apologetics class to juniors in the school I taught at, Veritas. But, uh, three of my apologetics students were here this morning. And I would teach them all of these doctrines from Scripture and all of these arguments, and we would look at these different secular ideas and ideas from other religions, but I would keep coming back to, it's not the cleverness of your argument that's going to convert a sinner. You share the gospel. You leave the internal call to God's Spirit. And they would say, well, what about this? What about, you know, how, are we, how do we become most effective? I would say, look, I want you to be good stewards of your education here. You should make convincing arguments, but at the end of the day, God does not call you to results. He calls you to faithfulness. Be faithful in sharing God's word to others. God's word always accomplishes its purpose, even if the sinner you're talking to does not repent. You never fail when you share God's word and the gospel with others. You're called to faithfulness, not to results. You're called to give the external call. The Holy Spirit brings the internal call. You don't have the power in you to convince someone to become a believer. Their problem is not first and foremost intellectual. Their problem is spiritual. It's sin. We do not have the power to defeat sin. It's a problem of the heart, uh, the, which the catechism actually indicates here. The Holy Spirit changes us by giving our dead hearts, hearts of stone, life. He uses the power of the word to affect this change. John Calvin said, we are called to a knowledge of God, not that knowledge which, content with empty speculation and merely flits in the brain, but that which will be sound and fruitful if we duly perceive it, and it takes root 
in the heart. It's one of my favorite Calvin quotes. So the question naturally arises, if, if only the Spirit can regenerate a heart and make us born again, then how do we minister to hearts without any power to change them? Constantly pointing them to living waters, Jesus Christ, through his word. We cannot save souls, only the cross of Christ can do that by the power of the Spirit. By the counsel of the will of God, we give the external call without discrimination. Uh, the most difficult part of being a Christian, I, in, in many ways, can be dying to our sins, right? Sanctification. Sanctification is becoming more like Jesus, dying to our sins, living to righteousness. It's painful. It, we, we repent. We, we're convicted of our sins. We go before the Lord. I think the, the other difficult part is having the boldness to speak to others the gospel, to share God's word with them, right? That can be really, sometimes it can feel awkward, especially when it's like family, right? Or someone close to us. We, we have this awkwardness, and sometimes we're, we're wondering, well, what do we say? But remember, it's the power of God's word. God's word always accomplishes his purpose. Uh, I'll end by saying this. Herman Bovink who's a Dutch theologian, he wrote about this. I actually thought Calvin wrote about this in his institutes. Maybe Scott and I can meet after the service. And I went all through my institutes. I could not find it. I couldn't find it in my notes, but I did find it in Herman Bovick's Reform Dogmatics. If you want to read it, it's four volumes. I can, I can lend it to you. There's a concise version. It's only one volume. It's about this thick, but Mary Mack, you're more than welcome to borrow it. So, but Herman Bovick, he wrote about this. He said, we give the external call indiscriminately. It, right? we, we, we do that, but it's up to God to give the internal call to, to regenerate a dead sinner's heart by the Holy Spirit. But if that doesn't happen in your interaction with someone, it doesn't mean it's a failure. Herman Bovic wrote that God is going to use your witness of the word no matter what the results are. You see, for some, it will be for their salvation. I had a Presbyterian minister ministering to me when I was a sinner, dead in my sins, a rebellious teenager. I was getting in trouble with school. I actually was getting in trouble with the law at one point. And he took me aside and for months went through the catechism with me, went through scripture with me. And at the same time, uh, there weren't many youth pastors in my area at the time. So a bunch of the churches, including that, uh, another Presbyterian church, they paid this local missionary. These churches banded together cross-denominationally, and they paid this missionary to go into the public school and to witness and mentor and disciple kids. So I had these two Christians speaking in my life for months. And finally, one day, it, it, I became convicted of my sins, and I repented. I remember where I was. I was right in the office of my high school, about to get into some serious trouble. And God's law just, it spoke to me at that moment. I am a sinner and I need Jesus, cleansing blood. But you see, even if that doesn't happen with your interaction with someone, God is still going to use his word. And this is what Herman Bavik said. It will either be for a sinner's conversion or it will be for the sinner's judgment. I don't say that lightly. But you are the means of sharing that external call. God uses ordinary means to give his law and his grace, his gospel, to people. You never are a failure when you share the hope of God's word with sinners. Leave the results to God. Trust his word. Receive his grace. Let me pray. Our Lord, we are grateful for what you have done for us in Jesus through the cross and the empty tomb. And Lord, your grace continues to humble us as you call us in to your mission of being ambassadors of grace to the world. May you remove the fear of awkwardness from us. May we have boldness to speak your words, even 
when we don't know the words to say, merely if it's just meeting with someone and reading them scripture. Give us boldness to proclaim your words and the hope of Jesus Christ to all as the answer, as the salvation from our sins. Lord, give us power this week and in the months and years to come to be faithful ambassadors of your grace, to be people of the word, we pray.